everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar, Rethink Sustainability and Climate Risk. Before we begin, we wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your screen are multiple application engagement tools you can use. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can submit them through the Q&A engagement tool. We will try to answer these during the webcast, but if a fuller answer is needed, or if we run out of time, it will be answered later via email. For best viewing experience, we recommend using a wired internet connection and closing any programs or browser sessions running in the background. Webinars are bandwidth intensive, so closing any unnecessary browser tabs will help conserve your bandwidth. The webcast is being streamed through your computer. For best audio quality, please make sure your computer speakers are turned on and the volume is up so you can hear the presenters. Some networks cause slides to advance more slowly than others, so logging off your VPN is recommended. If your slides are behind, pushing F5 on your keyboard will refresh the page. Please note that this webcast is being recorded. An on-demand version of the webcast will be available approximately 24 to 48 hours after the webcast and can be accessed using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier. Now, I'd like to introduce Tony Kaczynski, President and Chief Executive Officer of Munich Re U.S. Holding. Tony? Thank you, Kristen, and welcome to all of you. As Kristen said, I'm Tony Kaczynski, President and CEO, Munich Re U.S. Holding. And I'm very glad you can join us for the Rethink Sustainability and Climate Risk Resilience webinar. Many might sound like a handful, but that's because the content is equally uh, encouraging. Climate change represents one of the greatest long-term risks in the insurance industry. According to the World Economic Forum, two of the three top risks in terms of likelihood are extreme weather and natural disaster. In addition, climate action failure or the failure to respond to these risks is the highest global risk in terms of impact. Climate change is, not, is of interest to me both personally and professionally, so I'm not talking to you just because of my role. For example, at my home in Pennsylvania, we just, we're just about ready for approval to be connected to a solar grid on our property that will not only provide an alternative renewable energy so, source, but will also help reduce CO2 emissions to the environment. So I'm especially excited to hear from today's panel. We're going to explore two very important topics related to climate change risk. First, we'll look at the key role our industry can play in building resilient communities. We'll also discuss how individual companies can make their own operations both more resilient and more sustainable, specifically by applying lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic response. Munich Re is committed to driving forward initiatives that foster climate-friendly technologies, that facilitate adaptation to climate change, and help communities to become more resilient. As a leader in this field, we first recognized and began tracking the emerging issue of climate change back in the 1970s. So this is not a new phenomenon for us. And I'm proud to share that Munich Re has been carbon neutral since 2015. The company invests in projects around the world, including solar, panor, uh, sol solar power plants, and wind farms, to promote the use of technologies that avoid greenhouse gas emissions. Last year, our installations generated approximately 2.8 million megawatt hours of green electricity, supplying power to around 700,000 households thereby avoiding some 800,000 uh, 800, tons of CO2 equivalents. At the beginning of this year, Munich Re joined the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance. This alliance is a group of pension funds and insurers who have pledged to decarbonize their portfolios to net zero emissions by the year 2050. And as Munich Re CEO Dr. Joachim Wenning said, and I quote, the world's leading companies are setting the issue higher on their agendas. 
which is creating an opportunity for us to bundle our strengths in combating climate change. Munich Re and other members of this alliance will hold themselves publicly accountable and will regularly report on their progress. The alliance does not plan to meet this carbon neutral portfolio goal through disinvestment. Rather, they'll work closely with portfolio companies to change business models and adopt climate friendly practices. When Munich Re joined this net zero alliance at the beginning of 2020, few would have predicted where the world would be today in terms of the COVID-19 pandemic crisis, the tragic loss of life, the months of lockdown, and the struggling global economy as a result. But despite this immediate threat that COVID poses, we must not lose sight of addressing climate risks that loom on the horizon. At Munich Re, we're thinking about how we can apply lessons learned from this pandemic crisis to become even more resilient ourselves and also help our clients on the same path. We're considering what our next normal will look like and how we might change our business practices. For example, how much can be accomplished remotely and still be effective? Do our employees need to come to the office every single day? Do we need to travel as much? What larger impact might these changes have for the environment? The COVID-19 pandemic has shown us that increasing resiliency must always be a priority, not a luxury. Considering the many ways the world has been caught completely off guard with this pandemic, how can we avoid the same disastrous situation or potentially disastrous situation when considering climate change risk? And as many experts have pointed out, despite early warnings, the impact of the pandemic is due partly to the lack of preparedness. There's increasing evidence that climate change is already influencing the frequency and severity of natural catastrophe events. The California wildfires, for example, of 2017 and 2018, and flooding caused by tropical cyclones, Harvey and Imelda, are just a few examples. The pandemic has illustrated that the best course of action is on an ex ante basis rather than an ex post one, meaning deal with it before it happens versus after. How can our society act immediately to mitigate the effects of climate change? That's the question. Today, we have a distinguished panel of experts to consider these climate change questions so, so vital for our companies, our industry, and the world. So I'm pleased now to turn this discussion over to Mark Bove, meteorologist and natural catastrophe solutions manager for Munich Re US, who will be moderating today's panel session. I thank you. Thank you, Tony. Welcome everyone and good afternoon from Princeton, New Jersey to the Munich Re Think Sustainably, Sustainability and Climate Risk webcast. My name is Mark Bove. I am a meteorologist and natural catastrophe solutions manager with Munich Re America's reinsurance division. I will be acting as your moderator for the panel today. Uh, with us today on the panel are Alice Hill, who is a senior policy fellow uh, for climate change policy at the Council of Foreign Relations. Uh, also, she serves on the board of, of the Munich Re uh, Board of Management. Also with us today is Craig Fugate, uh, Chief Emergency Management Officer for One Concern and previously head of FEMA under the Obama administration. Lastly, we have Ingo uh, Pisha Schneider, uh, who is uh, our Senior Vice President and Strategic Innovation Leadership uh, Leader at Munich Re. So I would like everyone to th give them a, a welcome for being here today. And I would like to get right into uh, the first question. And I would like each of the panels to open up today's discussion by spending about five minutes discussing what Tony said. Uh, we are in the middle of a pandemic right now, and you know there we have seen the emergency response to the pandemic. We would like you to express your thoughts on you know what are the similarities and differences between the response to a pandemic as compared to climate risk. And also, has the response over the past five months to COVID influenced 
changed or reinforced any of your thoughts when you approach uh, risk from both pandemic and climate? With that, I would like to uh, go ahead and start with Alice. Alice, if you would, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. What a pleasure to have a chance to join you and Tony and the other panelists. It's uh, really an important topic for us to focus on at this particular moment in really human history. You know, humans are not particularly good uh, at preparing for catastrophic risk. And that's particularly ironic now since our ability for foresight with technology, the Internet of Things, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning has never been better to have foresight. But with both the pandemic as well as the extremes that climate change has brought and will continue to bring in the near future, we know that these things will occur. It's a matter of when, not if. And in fact, we have stacks and stacks of reports warning about the risk of a pandemic. We also have even examples uh, in our past uh, throughout history where humankind has dealt with pandemics. But we find with this pandemic that our preparations had fallen short. And with climate change, of course, we will see extremes that are unfamiliar in recorded human history because by definition, climate change brings ever greater extremes as we go forward. With both of these risks, if we invest in preparedness, uh, the science and the analysts, the economists tell us that that will result in reduced damages. The most widely cited uh, statistic is that for every dollar we spend in building resilience, we save somewhere around $6 or more. I think that the pandemic has significant rele relevance for under our understanding of climate risk uh, uh, for three major reasons. The first is that the pandemic shows us what a stress test, a real live stress test of our ability to learn and adapt in the face of deep uncertainty looks like. With both pandemics and climate change impacts, there is deep uncertainty. We know that they will occur, but we do not know always exactly when. And with the impacts, we don't know where they'll be geographically located. So we have challenges to the human brain in assessing how big is the risk with all this uncertainty. So the question becomes, can we use our experience and our knowledge with this pandemic to prepare for the uncertainty of climate change? The second is that the pandemic gives us a very clear illustration of what catastrophic risk looks and feels like. It's a global event. We have all experienced it collectively, and it has revealed some very unsettling things about certainly inequalities within our society, as well as decisions about how countries will deal with the threats. It's shown us just how interconnected we are, including our supply chains, which have previously been just-in-time supply chains, and that if there's a break in our connectedness, it can have cascading effects. Cascading failures can occur in our systems. It's shown us how a risk can send shockwaves that literally tank whole economies, at least temporarily. So we are right now in the midst of an extraordinary global economic contraction. We don't know how deep and persistent it will be or nor, nor how long its impacts will last. And climate change brings us with that type of threat, but it may even be more lasting than a pandemic. The impacts also with a pandemic and with climate change can fall very unevenly, particularly on the most vulnerable. This pandemic shows us how travel and trade, just-in-time supply chains, urban density, lack of access to clean water and sanitation can increase risk to particular populations. And it also shows us how steps we personally take to reduce risk in the case of pandemics, staying home, washing our hands, wearing masks, 
can reduce the risk not only to ourselves, but to others. Lastly, I believe that COVID provides governments in particular an opportunity to think about the role risk reduction needs to play in government planning. Will we place risk reduction, including reducing the risks of climate change, at the heart of future government planning, at the heart, really, of our recovery from the pandemic? We need to make sure we've looked at this risk and then going forward that when we make investments in infrastructure and when we respond to events, when we provide funding for emergency response, that we have in mind, how can we build resilience for the future, for the impacts that we know will come with climate change? So I hope today we'll have an opportunity to explore some of the opportunities that we can do that to make sure we're leaning forward and using this tragic event that is a global disaster to learn and improve our work on climate. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. Uh, Craig, uh, would you like to go next? Sure, you know, picking up on some of the themes that Alice talked about, uh, the, the things that I see that are very similar with uh, addressing both the impacts of climate change as well as COVID is a, a trend we've seen, unfortunately, in the last decades, and that is an, uh, an, almost an outright war on science when it doesn't agree with your economic policies. We've seen the disinformation that's taken place to play down the risk of climate change. Unfortunately, now it's hard to deny these impacts that we're seeing uh, as every record setting up, um, weather event occurs. Um, similar to what we saw with COVID, in many cases where the science had specific recommendations, they were either delayed or not implemented in time, resulting in more deaths and more impacts from COVID. Uh, we've seen how leadership plays a key role in both of these areas. And as much as we talk about plans, uh, it's also the ability to execute your plans. Uh, again, when we looked at uh, what had been prepared to look at pandemics, Nobody had all the answers, but the plans would have been a launch pad for communities and states and the federal government to begin with. Yet in many cases, they were not followed or again, the experts were ignored. So as we're challenged with you know, COVID in the short term, I think long term, we have the same challenges with climate. And it's no longer a question about climate changing. The question is, will we be able to adapt fast enough, particularly our more vulnerable communities. Uh, too often, I've seen uh, a, a, a thirst to rebuild after disasters, and in many cases, rebuild right where the disaster happened and not make a lot of changes. And part of this has been a very lenient federal disaster policy, which in many cases uh, is masking what you will see when you don't price risk appropriately, and that is, uh, construction and development in unsustainable ways for current known risk, much less future risk as we're seeing with the climate disruptions. Uh, President Obama threw down a challenge to us at FEMA in 2012 uh, in the aftermath of Sandy when he said, you know, the discussion about climate change is over. We really need to talk about climate adaptation. How do we make investments in our future in an infrastructure and where and how we're going to build and not use archaic concepts like a 100-year risk of return based upon past weather data when the weather is changing and becoming record-setting faster than our historic approach to building and maintaining infrastructure. So the lessons of COVID are similar to the lessons, unfortunately, we've seen with climate. And that is we often have not listened to the science. We have, in many cases, seen attempts to uh, promote economics over these at the risk of long-term impacts. And now that we're seeing these impacts occur, it is again showing us that we do not have time. Climate change is not something that will be in our children's future or our grandchildren's future. It's gonna be now. And how do we address that? And then the last piece, as we see, 
Pandemics, climate change, and another risk, cyber, significant cyber attacks, are also types of hazards that in many cases we have not thought through how our very efficient global supply chains are not resilient in these impacts and how that can undermine a country's ability to respond to disasters or recover due to dependencies outside of their control. So as we look at this, I think climate change, pandemics, cyber attacks are what I call borderless disasters. They can impact us any place in the world and yet have impacts at home as well. Uh, so that, Mark, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Craig. Ingo, uh, you have a slightly different view and perspective on this issue and your role in innovation. Uh, how are you seeing some of the similarities and differences, the challenges around uh, innovating around climate and what COVID tells us about it? Yeah, thank you very much, Mark. So um, we were conducting research into what businesses, um, larger enterprises, but also small and medium-sized businesses, as well as state and um, local governments and um, insurance customers would see um, to be very relevant when they have experienced um, net cap events such as um, hurricanes, a lot of wildfires in the past. So as we're in the innovation space, we keep um, validating the desirability um, and also the um, commercial uh, viability of, of solutions. And what we actually identified is um, very much aligned with what we've just heard. Um, that was a couple of months ago. Um, we identified nine key problem areas. Um, those were the insights that, that we gathered. And um, let me just list them out very quickly. So the first one, the first problem area um, that we actually saw was unaware, overwhelmed, and confused. And again, this applies pretty much to all the three different customer segments we were looking at. Um, second one, short-term prioritization, um, spending, um, financial means or efforts on short-term um, topics rather than looking at the long-term effects. Labor challenges, another one, but also communication complexities and breakdowns. And then individual versus collective interests. Um, I think this is an, an important one. Third party risks and social inequality definitely was there too. Um, reputational impacts and of course, lack of standardization. So. Um, as, as again, as I've said, as we're in the innovation business, we keep um, going back um, pretty much all the time to um, to customers and we're checking desirability. So actually, our research unfortunately had foreshadowed what we were um, then about to witness during the pandemic. Um, so, and, and if you look at the, the, the nine different insights, themes, or problem areas, I think they're all very applicable to what we have seen during the pandemic. So take, for instance, unaware, overwhelmed, and confused. So this was um, the topic of not knowing how to deal with the virus, what should the response be, and so on. Short-term prioritization, um, there was little to no real preparedness for such an event. Communication complexities and breakdowns, um, how difficult it was to send clear and understandable messages to the public and the concerned businesses. But then take another one, let's say third party risk, um, as we've heard about um, the supply chain challenges um, regarding the um, personal protective equipment, medical compounds that would be relevant, but also hygienic products. So um, I think clearly neither our society nor the economy were really prepared for this pandemic. And uh, one of the, the key learnings that we have taken away from this should be that we need to move further upstream in the disaster cycle and pay more attention to the preparation, um, the mitigation and the response um, activities. So it's not going to be enough to just stand back and actually look at how we can um, recover. Um, we need to do much more upstream. So. Um, we were also picking up market signals um, that there was an increased awareness regarding those catastrophic events. So I think it, it did something to, um, to send out a very strong warning um, that there need to be proactive solutions. However, on the other hand, what we have also seen that the 
pandemic context has further added to the challenge um, that climate risk for many businesses, at least, and for many individuals, is still very far out. Um, and um, this has only been exacerbated by the um, current challenges from the direct hits of the pandemic and the economic um, challenges that, that many are facing. So um, let, me, let me close with, with this. I think it is clear that the impact of the current pandemic has clearly emphasized our conviction that resilience and risk management need to work together on combining the risk transfer, the closing of the insurance gap with more proactive strategies and solutions in risk mitigation and response. Over to you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Wingo. And just a reminder for the audience, uh, we are accepting questions via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, feel free to submit. We are going to hold all audience questions till the Q&A at the end, but uh, feel free to submit questions at any time. So, Ingo, this was very good comments. Thank you, everyone, uh, for your initial thoughts. And there are a lot of stakeholders in what Ingo coined this uh, resilience cycle and kind of some of the bad habits our society stays in that kind of perpetuates the inertia of these bad, this res of a poor resilience cycles. So, so I want to kind of break this down going forward and look at some of those stakeholders and the unique uh, but overlapping to some extent, issues that affect all of them. So I'd like to start uh, with the government's role, but in this case, I would like it to, I would like uh, Craig Ellis, if you can focus on state and local level. I think one of the lessons from the COVID pandemic is that the federal government isn't always necessarily going to be there to help you with response and planning. So, and also, even if the federal government is very proactive, in promoting resilience, we still need partners and people willing to work towards resilience at the state and local levels. You know, what steps and actions do you think could be taken to really affect climate resilience and sustainability at these levels of government in the United States? Uh, Craig, why don't you go first this time? Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Mark. Local and state governments actually have one of the strongest tools to use to begin bending the curve on you know, reducing climate vulnerability and building more resilient communities. And that is local and state building code requirements and land use planning. Uh, the federal government doesn't really do this. They usually end up influencing this through funding and policy, but the actual work's done at the state and local level. And where we've seen states and local governments adopting more progressive building codes, uh, looking at land use, reducing growth in high hazard areas, they are bending the curve on these disasters. That, however, is not what we're seeing in many parts of our communities. We are actually seeing rapid growth in coastal communities that will face future risk of flooding from sea level rise and coastal storms yet development seems to be unabated because of programs like the National Flood Insurance Program and other enabling policies that permit state and local governments to continue that high-risk growth. So we know that some areas have been very progressive here. Others are only looking at growing their tax base. And I think that's part of the conversation we need to do and tools we need to develop, is helping communities understand the resiliency of their tax base when they don't make these changes and what could happen to them as we see more climate driven impacts. Thank you, Alice, any uh, comments? Sure. Craig has uh, described the problem that we have very well. You know, under our constitution, these land use and building code issues fall largely to the states or some states delegate that to particular municipalities. And so they make the choices about uh, where and how building occurs. Unfortunately, uh, because of the pressures Craig has indicated, uh, there are uh, desires to build a tax base. And that means that we see more development at in at-risk areas. In fact, 
In Connecticut and New Jersey, we've seen in about the last decade more development in at-risk areas than other areas. Right after the terrible Paradise Fire in California, the city, uh, county of Los Angeles approved a 19,000 home development in an area that based just on historical risk, not looking at the future climate exacerbated risk of wildfire was already at extreme risk of wildfire. So uh, local communities face great pressure to allow building near water Many people want to live close to water, but we know that living close to water can uh, increase your risk of flooding. Uh, many people want to live uh, in the wildland urban interface, which we know can burn uh, very quickly under climate worsened conditions of drought and greater heat. But we also have the need for affordable housing. So we're going to have to come to grips with this. Uh, and I do think that one important player is the federal government, because the way we have set up our disaster recovery, unfortunately, we come in after the fact. And as we've heard, communities want to build back right away. Uh, and then the federal government gives them the money and there's no uh, clear signal that they need to build back better. We don't have climate resilient building codes yet or strict enforcement of land use decisions that don't put people at risk. So we'll need to work on those in order to improve our resilience to climate risk going forward. Very much so. And I will regroup on this as we focus a bit more on cities and localities because uh, the municipals are municipalities themselves are just one piece of that local equation. But I want to talk quickly about another piece of this equation, which are corporations and businesses. You know, what is ultimately the role and responsibility of corporate of America in addressing sustainability and climate risk? And how do you see corporate behavior changing from the lessons of the current pandemic? Uh, with that, uh, Ingo, uh, you, from your view within Munich Re, you know, what is our role, both as a sure and a good corporate uh, world and U.S. citizen in addressing these issues? Yeah, so um, as a um, stressed before in, in the introductory remarks, um, there is this very significant um, phenomenon that we have with, witnessed during the pandemic. So on the one hand, climate change is being down-prioritized um, on account of direct impact of the pandemic and um, economic challenges. And then at the same time, on the other hand, we're seeing an increased um, awareness for resilience. So um, to translate um, this experience into rethink operational preparedness and um, for, for disruption and, and disasters. So many organizations have realized, um, let's make strategic decisions now so that we will be, um, be better prepared for the future. And um, this momentum per se, we see as an opportunity to align sustainability and climate change adaptation with resilience efforts. So I think corporate America could do a number of things to address sustainability and climate risk. For example, disclose uh, climate change risks, um, start working towards um, zero carbon footprint. We've heard Tony um, about the Net Zero Alliance, um, invest more in environment, social and governance initiatives, commit to more sustainability and climate resilience, manufacturing and supply chain. And then I think important is to strive to become best in class role models in, in this in sustainability and climate risk in their respective industries. So eventually these examples will not just be the right thing to do, but also I think a competitive advantage. Um, so I think businesses should consider um, entrepreneurial and strategic decisions right now. Um, so combine the principles of sustainability with innovation and challenge the status quo of um, their business and operating models. There's a lot of opportunity in climate change, um, adaptation and resilience. So I think the same way an organization needs to continually rethink its business model, it should also include climate risks in their strategy and operation. So I think both aspects um, do tremendously good for long-term viability. 
Another thing that we just quickly add is that we need to also not um, exclude the small and medium-sized businesses as they are also the backbone of many communities and a large employer and also um, a significant force behind innovation and new jobs. So I think this is also um, an important factor. Thank you, Ingo. I'm going to break my own rules quickly for one second. We have a question clarifying about a question asking you to clarify your comment about moving further upstream in regard to resiliency. Can you uh, speak to that quickly? Uh, because that might help people understand that concept uh, going forward for the rest of the talk. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So um, many organizations, individuals um, have been relying on risk transfer solutions on farms for disasters, um, you know, um, for, for better or worse. Um, what we're seeing with the, um, with the increase of severity and, and frequency of, um, of, of, of events, this is not going to be sustainable anymore. Um, we believe that there needs to be more done in terms of the risk reduction in preparation, um, you know, to such um, disasters and disruptions. So this is pretty much the idea behind resilience to, um, to, to give the tools and the, um, the solutions to the people that need it in order to, um, to actually be able to make a change in mitigation in, of risks instead of waiting until it happens and then trying to rebuild it. Um, it's, it's, um, it's the idea of bouncing back but as we're seeing also here um, with, um, with the, um, the COVID situation, it's also about bouncing forward to a new normal. No. Thank you. So basically, it's, you know, when a home or business gets to the insurer, really a lot of the steps that could be taken for resilience have already passed. So this is kind of getting into the cycle and conversation of resilience before we get to that point uh, so we can help make sure that more buildings are resilient going forward. Do I have that right? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Good. Thank you. Uh, Alice, uh, from your viewpoint, uh, you know, what can corporate America and from the, from mom and pop stores on Main Street all the way up to the Walmarts and Amazons of the world do to address uh, climate resilience? Well, I think that uh, they need to look at their own resilience first. All, all of these things start at home. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, we're not confident that many corporations at least they haven't publicly disclosed uh, that they are looking closely at these risks. I will uh, say that uh, Munich Re has been a leader uh, and has made public disclosure of risks it faces, but that's not uh, common because it's not regulated. There's a growing concern uh, that certainly among the more sophisticated corporations, there needs to be greater disclosure. Uh, there's a view that at least under the U.S. securities law, it's a material risk uh, in that it should be fully um, vetted and uh, exposed to investors. But we haven't seen a lot of uptick on that. Uh, the Task Force on Climate-Related Disclosures put forth a number of recommendations. A recent survey showed that just a few, a low percentage, about 4% of the 1,100 companies that were reporting actually reported against all those recommended uh, standards. So uh, what do we do here uh, to encourage greater understanding at home of, uh, uh, at, of risk? Uh, there are a number of levers that uh, seem to be uh, becoming of greater interest as uh, corporations to inspire corporations to do this. Just before COVID broke, we saw Larry Fink, uh, the head of BlackRock, manager of $7 trillion assets, uh, state that uh, climate risk equals investment risk. Uh, sent that to uh, the major leaders, uh, corporate leaders. We saw Mark Carney, when he was the head of the Bank of uh, England, set stress tests uh, for major corporations. Unfortunately, in the face of COVID, the Bank of England has pulled back from that, has decided that it will not run the stress tests for certain financial institutions, at least postpone them for now. We saw Canada in its own uh, bailout package tell corporations, uh, large corporations, that in order to get the bailout money, they would have to disclose their climate risk. 
So we need to have more first movers here uh, that come forward and are willing to disclose, even though uh, what we I've been privately told uh, may be a competitive perceived as a competitive disadvantage to disclose true climate risk. We're going to have to get over that hump so that all of us are understanding that risk and taking actions uh, both in our choices about where to invest, but importantly, these corporations are also preparing themselves for breaks in their supply chain, interruptions to operations, uh, facilities that may be underwater. Uh, one of the interesting things, if you look at Silicon Valley, it faces huge flood risk. And we have most of our, many of our tech companies centered right there, right on the water's edge. So there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, and um, right now it's on a voluntary basis. It will be interesting to see how this develops as the pressure uh, grows for governments to bail out after the fact, after these events. Thank, thank you, Alice. Uh, Craig, do you have anything to add regarding corporate responsibility? Well, I think as, as was already presented that increasingly this may become a fiduciary responsibility back to shareholders uh, to disclose these risks, uh, which would come from the regulatory environment. But I also see that there may be companies becoming more aware of how vulnerable they are to global supply chains, climate disruptions, uh, impacts to their workforce. And we'll begin looking at this as not so much of something they have to do, but rather it's a way to maintain a competitive advantage in a rapidly changing marketplace and that building financial resilience in their own uh, abilities would incorporate climate change. I think it's going to be driven by two things. It's either going to be a pocketbook issue where it makes sense to make these investments or it's a regulatory issue where they are driven to do this either because of disclosure or regulatory uh, guidance to essentially set a level playing field, but everybody's got to do this. I think the most vulnerable part of this are the small businesses. They're not really in a position, uh, in many cases that we've seen with COVID-19, to weather these disruptions. Uh, even the insurance products that would be commonly available are generally going to be priced beyond what they can afford. If you're looking at COVID with disruptions now going on months for small businesses, but they do have a very powerful voice at their local level of government to demand changes in where we, how we build, uh, to start investing in building more resilient communities and making sure that we're not creating resiliency divides where we're only doing resiliency in the more affluent areas of our communities and countries, but really looking at everybody because they have to look at where their workforce comes from. And if they don't come to work, they're out of business. Craig, uh, thank you very much. And I, I want to stick with some of the themes. And I'm going to follow, keep this question towards you. You know, I'm going to focus back in on the communities as you were just discussing. You, you know, they truly are on the front lines of climate resilience. There, as you mentioned, there need to be solutions for people of all socioeconomic classes and status because ultimately it's one whole community that needs to survive and thrive. And of course, if the tax base is destroyed, the town will struggle to be able to survive. So to that extent, you know, I'm curious about, you know, what kind of incentives can be developed? And the incentives can come from government, can come from corporate or other or other entities. What incentives can we develop to limit help limit development in high risk areas like floodplains and yet still allow a community to be able to grow and thrive. Also, is it also just incentives? Do there need to be disincentives around this as well? And what is the correct balance of carrot versus stick in this situation? Uh, any thoughts you might have would be interesting to hear. I don't know what the correct balance is. I know there's not one solution, but I know what some of the unintended consequences of the current system are. Uh, we tend to bias our investments, uh, those federal dollars that we use to uh, mitigate the effects of these on a factor of how many dollars are saved for every dollar invested. And if you think about that, an example of New Orleans, if you only made the investments where you had the greatest savings uh, in mitigation, then after Matthew Katrina, you would have only invested in places like Lakefront and you would have not made any investments in the Ninth Ward. So I think one policy change we need to make is to de-emphasize that the uh, dollar saved is the only measure of success of investment. 
We also need to look at lives and livelihoods saved as another factor that should have equal weight to dollars being saved. Otherwise, uh, our programs will continue to grow what I call a resiliency divide that some of the most at-risk communities with less resources, lower income, and not always providing the highest dollar return on investment for mitigation will be left behind and increasingly vulnerable. The incentive side of this, I think, goes back to this idea that communities need to be looked at holistically. And as we look at how we're building our resiliency, I think we have to put as much emphasis on people as we do infrastructure. I hear resiliency about infrastructure all day long. I hear very little about resilient neighborhoods, resilient communities, resilient people. And I think if we're gonna address climate change, we're gonna have to look at this both from how do we incentivize this by not just looking at the dollar return, but also broaden the definition of resiliency to include people, not just stuff. Thank you. Alice, any comments on the role of incentives and disincentives to building resiliently? Well, unfortunately, uh, in the United States, we have a number of uh, disincentives uh, for resilience because we tend to pay so much money in response. Uh, we're seeing now trillions of dollars going out for the pandemic, but historically we've seen enormous growth in the payments for climate bailouts, disaster bailouts of communities. And then we've required relatively little uh, in exchange, and we haven't really insisted on uh, building back better or leaving dangerous areas. I think the whole paradigm uh, will need to shift as these costs grow. We need to rethink uh, how we deliver assistance. You know, before World War II, the federal government didn't really play a significant role in disaster resilience. It was community-based. It was uh, fell on the uh, shoulders of the survivors as well as uh, NGOs. And we need to um, get back away from the assumption that the federal government will pay uh, in the wake of disasters and try to shift that, as we've heard, to focus on investments pre-disaster. And that could mean telling communities, we're not going to support you if you want to build in these risky areas. We did that with the Coastal Barrier Resilience Act. Uh, Resources Act in 1982, uh, where we basically said, if people want to live and develop in these fragile barrier islands along the Atlantic coast, that's fine. But the federal government is not going to support that long term. And the latest estimate is that in the next 50 years, that will save the federal government over $100 billion. So we need to look at how, what messages we're telling to our elected, mostly elected political leaders at the municipal and state level as to how they can responsibly invest federal taxpayer dollars in resilience going forward. Thank you, Alice. And I'd like to stay with you for a moment because you mentioned, you know, we need to have politicians that understand standing issues. But of course, you know, politicians respond to the will of their constituencies and what's important to them as well. And I believe one of the biggest challenges, and I experienced this in my job, uh, working on climate resilience and building codes and building code resili uh, resiliency of building codes, is where do you get that message? You know, how do we get individual homeowners and business owners to understand what their climate risk is at the at their actual home at their actual business and so they understand and an educated populace is more likely to demand action so you know is there who how do we get to these people to get, get them to understand what their climate risk is and ultimately do you have any thoughts on who ultimately has that responsibility is it really on the homeowners to educate themselves or is this a governmental at any level effort or local effort to get that knowledge into the community to create that groundswell of demand? Well, that's a great question. 
I think uh, we're going to see a variety of sources that need to provide this information. At the corporate level, we're already seeing what uh, my friend Jesse Keenan, a professor at Harvard and Tulane calls the climate services arms race. We're seeing uh, different companies come out with a variety of products based on uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, GIS mapping to better understand the particular risks that a corporation may face. Uh, and they're also purchasing um, uh, modeling from some of the major catastrophe modelers. Uh, the challenge with that is it's expensive and that information is often proprietary, so that's not available to the average homeowner. Uh, there are some companies moving into that space to provide information to the homeowner, but there's a question whether the homeowner will see that as uh, a necessary item. I think there are two solutions here. The first is that I believe the federal government, with its enormous capabilities in science, should be providing a basic level of information to all Americans about that risk. That would include better mapping of future risk of floods, better mapping of wildfire, extreme heat risk. So it's easily, you can, as an American, easily determine what the risks that you are most likely to face in within a certain amount of time. Uh, I also think, again, that the federal government needs to make clear that um, it will not subsidize risk investments. And so we have to look at what mortgages is the federal government underwriting? Are those going to be underwater mortgages? At some point, we need to insist that uh, there's disclosure uh, for anything. And I think the tool here is if federal task taxpayer money is involved, the federal government insists that we're getting the best disclosure possible so that we're not wasting federal taxpayer dollars. The states and localities can choose how they want to use their tax dollars, but when it comes to federal tax dollars, there should, in my opinion, be a deep emphasis on making sure that those are spent resiliently, which would require homeowners to understand their risk and withhold uh, support from the federal government if they want to make that risky choice similar to what we've done in the barrier islands. Craig, I'm sure you have some thought about individual homeowners and business owners. Well, there's a couple of key areas. Uh, this is more specific to the United States and to uh, the National Flood Insurance Program, which is the FEMA-operated uh, federally subsidized insurance program for flood risk. And that is many states don't even have disclosure requirements for past flood events. I think we could start with very easy things we could do today, and that all states should require full disclosure on climate risk, including flooding, wildfire, or interface, and other known risk. Uh, that buyers should not have to find out after the fact. The second thing is to quit growing the risk. As Alice says, there's a lot of federal policies that are enabling risk. We should take one, I think, very easy step, and that is direct the National Flood Insurance Program and prohibit them from writing policies for new construction in flood zones. Uh, we have a lot of people at risk. I don't think we can end the flood insurance program quickly, but uh, a question I often ask, if the private sector won't insure a flood risk, why is the taxpayer subsidizing that risk? And this is really for new construction. The existing flood uh, policies, I think we have both a fiduciary and moral obligation not to close that program down, that is a longer term uh, challenge. But just think, a lot of the coastal development we're seeing in high risk areas is only possible because of programs like the flood insurance program for that new construction. Take that away and allow the market the price risk. We may now start seeing changes in how and where we're developing. This isn't about taking away development rights. This isn't taking away uh, people's ability to build their communities and local officials to pass and, and deal with this as far as near the building codes and ordinances. It just starts to answer, ask a different question. Why is the taxpayer, federal taxpayer, subsidizing? Take away that subsidy for this new construction. And something as, as straightforward as just not writing new policies under the National Flood Insurance Program and allowing builders and developers to seek out private insurance markets to cover that risk and let that guide how development takes place. 
Thank you, Craig. And I have one last question that I personally would like the panel before we go to the audience Q&A. And this is, obviously, we have a lot of insurance and reinsurance companies on the line. So I'd like to focus the final question uh, towards their industry as a whole. You know, what leadership roles can innovative insurance companies and, and work towards and develop solutions to fostering a more resilient future, whether it's COVID, climate, or going forward. What do you feel the role is for this industry going forward in addressing particularly climate risk and resiliency? Uh, Craig, why don't we start with you? I think two things. One's going to be advocating on the policy side with your lobbyists to get Congress to start moving the needle away from the taxpayer subsidized risk back into insurance managed risk. We're seeing and have seen this over the last 20 years, a transfer of risk from the insurance markets to the taxpayers as many local and state governments have gone self-insured and in many cases carry no actual insurance. And again, I always remind people when FEMA pays out your tax dollars in the United States, that's because of uninsured losses. So I think first thing is on the policy level is continue to put pressure on Congress to reduce this transfer of risk to the taxpayer and move it back to the private sector. I think that's a that's a key first step. The second thing is looking at products a little bit differently. I think the transaction of one to one to a company, to a business, to a homeowner is still leaving behind some of our most vulnerable kids. And knowing that there are a lot of different types of tools local governments use to try to bring back and grow businesses through uh, development areas, uh, economic incentives, uh, special districts, is looking at developing products that less marketing to individuals and small businesses that may be bundled and packaged and looked at in a way that could be community-based insurance. Oftentimes, uh, fees or uh, additional millage rates are applied in those areas to provide return to that economic area. Uh, but if you think about uh, with COVID and others, marketing to small businesses really, not, I don't think is gonna change much. Most of them won't be able to afford this. Uh, going into some of our most vulnerable communities with the current insurance products may not be a market solution. But looking at the ability to write policies for a neighborhood to an area that's an economic development zone that has some revenue stream where we may not be able to insure everybody against all perils, but we can at least provide that community with some financial resources in the event of a, a claims process that would be in addition to what federal assistance could occur. So uh, I think it's two things, the policy advocacy for the federal government to quit subsidizing risk and move this back to the market to manage and looking at new products that could go into underserved communities that individual products may not be able to uh, do much good, may not be much of an uptake on the market, but new tools that are more community-based may have the ability to offer protection as well as growing new revenue streams for the insurance industry. Thank you. Alice, uh, do you have anything to add on the role of insurers and reinsurers? Yes, uh, I think Craig has touched on uh, this is a time where there is the possibility of great innovation. Uh, we're seeing already, we know we have a very significant protection gap with flood insurance, which is the federal program. Uh, very few uh, uptake on that insurance in some of our communities. Uh, we need to figure out ways to close that gap. And then we're seeing gaps possibly be created uh, in areas that have experienced very damaging events. For example, California with the wildfires. So uh, how can we think about creative ways to close that gap? Can we have, uh, think about models that are a little more long-term? I don't mean uh, products that are a little more long-term. Uh, the annualized writing of insurance, I think, has left uh, some people 
uh, dropping it after the fact because they think it hasn't, the bad thing hasn't happened. I don't need insurance anymore. Uh, we've also seen even where there are federally insured requirements that uh, for mortgages that you have insurance that that's not being followed. We need to find ways to better track that to make sure that's occurring. Uh, and to extend any of that's private insurance uh, help there. Uh, and then finally, as Craig has mentioned, for communities who are hit with these terrible events, finding products that would help them immediately with recovery, uh, parametric insurance, for example, where uh, within 15 days, we saw after hurricanes Irma and Maria in the Caribbean, those uh, some of those governments got payouts immediately. And that, of course, gets a community back on its feet. Uh, very quickly. We're just at the beginning of this discussion. I chair a working group for uh, the California Commissioner for the Department of Insurance looking at possible uh, different products and ideas. But this is a moment where we may have to rethink uh, how we have historically presented insurance to help uh, bridge the gap and the lack of insurance to make sure that as many are insured as is possible. So it's gonna take a bringing together a lot of minds to think through this and come up with some creative solutions that will better protect all of us and our economy as well. Thank you, Alice. And you couldn't have provided me with a better segue to Ingo. Uh, Ingo, uh, what are you guys thinking in our innovation department about this? Any lessons uh, that you've learned that we're taking forward and looking to create new uh, products uh, for climate risk and resiliency? Yeah, thank you. So um, I think the one of the, the key lessons to take forward is, as I mentioned before, to, to apply the principles of innovation and startup methodology to this space. And I think this offers us with a unique opportunity to look beyond um, the traditional risk transfer and on top of the risk transfer to introduce new solutions that can really help um, customers with um, better understanding their risk um, situations um, to, to measure it, to understand it, but then also um, provide them with um, innovative solutions to, um, to manage resilience. So um, as, as we're um, fairly new as a, um, as a unit, um, as a resilience domain, we actually started just uh, at the outbreak of, of um, the pandemic um, we have a couple of early stage um, ideas um, in what we call ideation. This is the idea gathering and um, the exploration. And they are focused on um, scenario planning around business continuity, um, service offerings for resilience uh, professionals. We're also looking at um, risk technology that could help with scoring and translating scores into preparedness plans and actions but also flood and energy resilience. So we have one idea that, uh, where we could explore a flood, res flood resilience service solutions for entire neighborhoods. Let's see where this is going um, to protect um, the neighborhoods against flooding. Again, early stage. Um, so I think um, overall, another lesson I think that we have learned um, in the past is um, all of this is not going to be possible in, in the ivory tower um, and I think there is no space and resilience and innovation for, um, for um, single players. I think this is really based on um, active partnerships and an ecosystem of, of those partners. This is what we're doing. And I think this is the uh, way forward also for the entire industry. Thank you, Ingo. And thank you to the entire panel uh, for putting up with my questions. Now for the real interesting, insightful questions, which are the ones from our audience. Uh, once again, uh, if you do have a question, uh, please submit it via the Q&A button at the bottom of the uh, of the web browser for the uh, on 24 application. I will try to get to as many as I can in the next uh, 30 minutes. If we do not get to all questions, uh, if the panel is amenable, 
I will send out the questions and see if we can get some of these answered uh, uh, via email going forward. Uh, but uh, one point you made, Ingo, uh, is regarding the measure. How do you know, we're, we got a question regarding measuring resilience? And uh, we've talked about this, but it's really hard because so many people define resilience in different ways. Do you have any thoughts of you know how could we can at least one approach to creating a consistent measure of resilience? Yeah, I think it's um, I think it has to start with accepting the fact that. Um, there are many unknowns um, that we that we don't even know about. So I think it has to really start with accepting the fact that there is a need to um, to understand where things are going in the future, right? So um, what we have done in the past is look at um, historic data in order to be able to predict the future. I think what we have to understand better is that this is going to be um, increasingly difficult. Um, it, is, it is no secret that I think the insurance um, professionals and, and resilience haven't really been able to agree on, 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 on a certain standards. But I think what we will need to see is um, um, using the risk technology that we're having today and to, um, to enrich it with additional data layers and of course with additional questions that go beyond um, understanding the vulnerability or exposure of a certain infrastructure, um, but to look at other aspects that actually um, the community or the business can, can relate to uh, beyond your own um, risks. And Alice, Craig, uh, you mentioned in your experience with the Obama administration that defining resiliency was an a next to impossible challenge because everyone views it. Do you do you still view uh, defining and having a common measurement as critical, or is or should we avoid getting bogged down in the weeds to extent with this definition? Well. For me, uh, I was in the White House under President Obama, and we examined this question, first two questions, uh, what is the definition of resilience, and then uh, how do we measure it? Uh, and with both uh, issues, we determined that there are many efforts afoot to uh, both define and measure resilience, uh, but if uh, during the time of, of a political office, if we were to try to resolve those issues, uh, we wouldn't make progress on other forms of policy. So uh, we selected a definition that we used. Uh, now Congress has told FEMA to come up with a definition for the entire federal government uh, as to resilience. And uh, we saw the proliferation of metrics uh, throughout various federal agencies. One concern that we uncovered was that perhaps these metrics would come out with different results uh, and be very confusing for the communities, but uh, that was difficult to unravel in a short amount of time. It will be, uh, I think Craig has called it the holy grail, if we can get to a uh, single uh, measurement for resilience, It'll be very powerful, uh, but as all of us know, these are dependent uh, resilience is dependent on a number of factors, and it may be almost impossible to capture all of the factors from the personal to the community-wide to geography, topography, education, uh, financial means, really everything uh, adds up to the level of resilience. But uh, I think it's a worthy goal because until we can measure it, uh, we won't count it. Uh, uh, what we count counts. Uh, and until we can do that, it will be harder to make progress in this field. Oh, thank you, Alice. Craig, a slightly different question. We have a, we have a question from the audience about FEMA and the flood mapping. You know, is there a way that you can see the government can work with the private sector to facilitate or speed up the updating and the improved resolution of these maps? Well, that's actually what theoretically FEMA does. We contract with the private sector uh, to update the maps. FEMA doesn't actually do the mapping. Uh, it goes to this idea of 
uh, what the purpose of the maps were, and that was to set flood insurance rates. Uh, they have yet to incorporate uh, climate risk into that. Uh, it was never done in a resolution to actually get down to uh, uh, what many people think is possible and we've seen with technology to do a better job of. And it has unfortunately been underestimating risk as we continue to see flooding well outside of the special flood risk area, what most people, the misnomer is a hundred year flood zone. And then there's the political aspect of this. And that is every time that we were involved in updating maps that showed an increased flood risk, the political realities was we met opposition at the local state and even from members of Congress uh, that opposed the maps, uh, saying they've lived there all their lives and had never flooded, and um, we didn't know what we were doing. So FEMA is often placed in a situation where because the maps are tied to flood insurance requirements, that there is opposition when the maps show an increasing risk. Surprisingly, we have virtually no opposition if it reduces that risk and reduces the area that may be in a mandatory purchase. So the challenge with those maps are, again, the purpose is, is to define the requirements for where insurance must be purchased and what the rates are. It doesn't incorporate future risk, although there's discussion about that, and it is not using some of the best technology and higher resolution maps uh, to produce that data. Uh, but because of the political opposition to that, it only, I think, makes it more challenging. The better resolution we have, I don't think it's going to show less risk. So we also need to not only embrace the technology, we're also going to have to embrace the idea that local and state officials need to understand that without this data, they're flying blind as they're planning and growing their communities for future risk. Craig, while um, I'm asking you, uh, we have another question regarding uh, resiliency in the tribal nations. I know uh, the Navajo tribe is having a horrible time with the COVID epidemic, but is the federal government as engaged uh, with the resilience of tribal nations as compared to other state and local entities? Well, one thing that we did in the Obama administration that didn't get a lot of notice was we changed a comma. And in Washington, a comma can mean a lot. Up until the change of that comma, all of the federally recognized tribes were treated only as the political subdivisions of a state instead of, as in all other federal law, recognized sovereign governments within the United States. We made that change. And so many of the programs that were only allowed or funded at the state are actually now available to the over 500 federally recognized tribes. But we know that there's a lot of technical support and work that has to be done. We have tribes as sophisticated as the Navajo Nation down to tribes which are member enrolled members only with no actual uh, land. And so as we look at the federally recognized tribes, at least we made the Stafford Act and the associated programs more equitable in treating the federally recognized tribes independent of states. Um, but the second piece of this is understanding the cultural significance and historical challenges that tribal lands face when we're dealing with natural hazards, lack of resources, and for some tribal governments, uh, existing and profound poverty that uh, in some of our tribal area government uh, meant that when FEMA was responding, we were not only dealing with the impacts of the disaster, we were dealing with a lot of the pre-existing economic issues that that nation was facing. Thank you, Craig. Uh, question directed towards Ingo. Ingo, uh, Munich Re is a large uh, international uh, reinsurer, and you know not every insurance company has the same scope and scale as our organization. There's many in the, especially in the United States, a lot of state level mutual companies, very small writers. You know, they don't have the resources to, to dig into climate related issues and understand necessarily. Are there ways that uh, we can help bring as an organization or reinsurers as a whole to help bring along the industry in understanding these issues to help build up resilience? Yeah, of course. I mean, first of all, there are tools that Munich provides that can actually help with that. I might like to remind the risk suite, uh, the risk suite, uh, sorry, the risk suite and Nathan, 
um, that actually covers uh, natural hazards. Um, that's um, a great tool that is being developed. Um, also, there's development on climate risk score. So I think there is a lot of um, technology and expertise that is um, being provided by Munich Re. Um, on top of that, what I think what we're planning to do with the resilience domain is, um, yeah, we like to um, have partnerships and we like to work in, in, in an ecosystem instead of, as I, as I mentioned before, being a single player. So um, I think it is, it is a good time actually to reach out and actually work with us instead of, um, yeah, um, not, not participating in this at all. No. Thank you, Wingo. And uh, I will do a little self-promotion of my team. Uh, we do have our white label inland flood endorsement product that uh, is available uh, to clients. And also, we're, which was part of our initiatives to help close the flood insurance gap. And we are also working on solutions for wildfire as well. So just a quick little plug on some other areas that we are working towards that. Uh, you know, so, uh, we have a question about the uh, organizations like the Institute for Business and Home Safety and FLASH. You know, how can the lessons and the knowledge that is uh, that these organizations develop through their research help drive more disaster mitigation and proper spending of our tax dollars towards mitigation? Uh, perhaps, Alyssa, take a first stab at that. Sure, I, I think these organizations do a terrific job of helping us understand the value that's brought by resilience measures um, in terms of uh, identifying uh, simple steps that can be taken to um, make a house, for example, withstand hurricane force winds uh, and help uh, promote that. Uh, I think that uh, they face the same challenge that uh, the federal government has faced in trying to encourage local communities to see the value if there's any additional cost. Uh, and that is a, uh, certainly in my work, I've seen that if there's a dollar added, I've had a developer uh, express this, they're not interested in uh, the change. So how can we collectively communicate the great value that is brought by modest investments in resilience? These organizations can help, but I think they need uh, help from others to amplify that voice so that it becomes just common knowledge that investing uh, a little bit in resilience can have a huge payoff for you personally, but also for these communities on the long haul. Any other comments from other panelists? Greg, having worked with um, folks at both Flash and, and the Institute of Business Home Safety, not only do they you know, do a lot of testing, and particularly with uh, IBIS, um, not just wind anymore. They're doing all multi peril earthquakes, but most recently wildfires, where they do full destructive testing. They're actually learning about how current construction techniques uh, are uh, vulnerable to these hazards, things that can be done to change that. And they have two prongs. One, what individual and homeowners can do to minimize their risk. And they've even come up with at IBIS low cost tips, recognizing that spending thousands of dollars to retrofit your home isn't practical for a lot of people. Uh, but also in providing better feedback to the standard organizations like the Insurance Code Council and others of what they're finding in the labs and how to incorporate improvements in building codes. And this doesn't necessarily result in some of the things that people want. And that is a feedback loop that says, if we're doing a better job of making homes more resilient, how do we tie that to uh, competitive pricing with insurance? And so this may be an opportunity, again, to look at uh, how insurance may drive innovation by looking at pricing, reflecting the best data and best building practices, and showing uh, at least what that value is, uh, either in the form of uh, uh, incentives or rates, similar to some of the discounts we see already for a lot of homeowner policies for things like having fire extinguishers. Yeah. 
Thank you. Uh, we have a number of questions from the audience. Once again, revisiting what incentives can be given local communities to help build resiliency. So, uh, Craig Ellis, maybe quickly, you know, what are just to reiterate? What are some of the key uh, actions that either federal, local, state governments, or communities as, as a whole can take to try to incentivize uh, climate resilience and sustainability. If you can just uh, do a quick list of some of your favorite uh, preferred actions, that would be great. Craig, I want you to start. Well, I think we could go back to some of the steps we had taken in the previous administration. Uh, with just one peril, which was flood, and requiring that all federal uh, investments in infrastructure, no matter the source of funding, would have to account for increased flooding risk through the floodplain management standards that were passed. Uh, we're seeing language in Congress now to increase, increasingly use the term building resiliency in infrastructure, but the single biggest thing we can do is to require that all of our federal investments uh, whether it's disaster response, but more importantly, HUD, Army Corps of Engineers, Department of Transportation, those monies go to state and local governments to build infrastructure, that they include the requirements to build resiliency in the future risk uh, and address climate adaptation. If you think about literally the amount of money that we spend as a nation in new construction with federal dollars, just requiring that to be built to higher standards would begin to flatten that curve on it, on the growth of risk we're continuing to see. I have to agree wholeheartedly with Craig. Uh, it is stunning to me that uh, the United States is still uh, putting up infrastructure with taxpayer dollars that is not resilient to the next flood or the next wildfire. Uh, and there are a whole host of reasons for that, uh, but one of them is that we just don't have a standard uh, for building resiliently. And as uh, Craig mentioned, uh, the Obama administration established such a standard for our greatest natural hazard, uh, flood, but we need to be driving towards that. And we can do that through the International Code Council. We could uh, insist that uh, we drive towards resilient codes with them. Uh, but in the absence of that, we should be screening any major investments in infrastructure for climate resilience. Uh, and then uh, we should uh, be requiring when communities are rebuilding uh, that everything that's being put up is resilient to what's happening in the future. Uh, it really, is uh, a story of good intentions causing some very costly decisions at the state and local level in the long run. We are continuing to leave people at risk, but we're also continuing to put people at risk. Uh, and uh, as we've mentioned, I think that one way to slow that process and actually turn it around is to turn off the federal spigot that keeps uh, giving money to communities to make decisions that will not turn out to be wise, really in the very near future as we see climate impacts accelerate. The pace is picking up uh, and uh, we're just not looking at whether that bridge can withstand the service life uh, that we have 50 years, but any engineer would tell you it's better if they last longer. Uh, and until we can start seriously talking about that and making sure it's done, we are really at risk of just throwing money away down the drain, keeping that spigot open uh, and not having communities ready for what we know is occurring and will get worse in the near future. And Alice, while we're talking about the federal spigot, so to speak, uh, in your words, you know, we had another proposal for an infrastructure bill today. And of course, infrastructure is very much li linked uh, to climate resiliency. As you said, we want our bridges and roads to last as long as possible. Do you think, you know, do we really need or is anyone within our federal government, whether Congress or agencies, you know, proposing a similar amount of grant to go towards climate risk and resiliency. Do you think we need some kind of large uh, uh, commit, financial commitment to address these risks from the federal government? 
Well, we need to move more towards mitigation of risks so that we reduce the amount of money that we have to spend on disaster recovery. Uh, and uh, there has been uh, some efforts under the uh, Congress under Trump to increase the amount of funding available for hazard mitigation in ways that had not occurred before, and that is uh, excellent. But the amounts that will be involved, uh, it's based on how much is paid out in any given year by the federal government. Uh, is, uh, well, maybe with COVID it will be uh, very significant. I haven't looked at that, but really uh, we need to um, change the way we think uh, and make the investments up front so that we don't have as much destruction going forward. That includes we need to make sure that anything, uh, any kind of investment for any period of time has been screened for climate resilience. That's number one. But also, will it help us build climate resilience is the second question that we need to ask. That is not yet occurring. Uh, and um, of course, every day that we uh, don't do that uh, means that we are uh, more at risk. So uh, I'm glad that we will be investing in infrastructure, but we need to seriously look at standards, uh, and what's required to keep that infrastructure resilient. This hasn't happened wide, on a widespread basis in the engineering community, in the architecture community, or in the land use planning community. And we need a revolution in all of those communities in order to make sure that we are really positioning ourselves to avoid unnecessary damage. No, thank you. Uh, we have about time for two more questions. Uh, this one I want to first direct to Craig. Uh, Craig, you had mentioned uh, the response that, you know, resilience uh, is experienced by different uh, communities based on their socioeconomic wealth, and richer communities are more likely to engage in resilience, but towns and communities as a whole need to be able to be resilient uh, as a whole, otherwise you're still going to have major disruption. You know, I want to talk about this with the with respect to, you know, we're starting to see some retreat from the beaches. Uh, there was apparently from, according to one of our, uh, our attendees, the recent article about that uh, wealthier residents of the city of Miami, Florida are starting to move into poorer but higher elevation neighborhoods uh, in preparation of sea level rise uh, further ag and the, the nuisance flooding, which is really sea, uh, global warming induced sea coastal flooding uh, getting worse. You know, how do we, you know, manage this as, you know, we're going to start seeing more and more struggle for the land that stays dry. Is there any r good response to this future potential and the jockeying for high ground? Well, the first thing is to be aware of it. Um, and we've seen this before where uh, affluence has moved into areas and displaced affordable housing, low-income communities, placing them further and further out, and in many cases, placing them in the more hazardous areas. So one, I think we need to be aware of it. Two, we need to call attention to it and address this that as we begin moving away from some of the high hazard areas, that we're not creating the second and third tertiary issues of displacement of the workforce as those that have the means move into these areas and displace those that don't. Uh, which goes back to a point that, as you were talking about, you know, how do we measure resiliency? And there's all the challenges there. I think one of the things we should be looking at is how resilient is our tax base. And that incorporates not only our affluency, but it also reflects the business community, the workforce, the schools, our ability to uh, provide goods and services. And if we looked at one measure, how resilient is a community's tax base, I think we could start making a lot more informed decisions about where and how we build the investments we need to make, but also how to ensure that our most vulnerable parts of our community aren't left behind and that we don't displace our workforce in the name of just building more resilient communities. Thank you. And the last question. 
question I would like to give to Ingo. Ingo, we have a question from the audience talking about uh, active partnerships. Obviously, Munich Re is not thinking or acting alone when trying to innovate new ideas around climate risk and resiliency. You know, can you give any examples of some of the active partnerships that you have, uh, whether across the greater Munich Re group or across other uh, organizations that are interested in this uh, types of partnerships? I personally can quickly mention uh, I do uh, work with the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety on understanding home resilience. But on climate, I know you're working on it with a few others. Could you, is it possible for you to list a few? Yeah, so um, Unigree is working with the Nature Conservancy, for instance, um, also the University of California, Santa Cruz. Um, we're also looking into um, other partnerships in, in the ac academia space, um, but also non-governmental organizations, non-profit organizations that are highly active in resilience, um, as well as startups, and of course, in the resilience tech space, and um, so what, what we're seeing is that this is um, the, the opportunity um, to come up with new um, ideas and value propositions. So as I mentioned before, resilience is, is an emerging space. Um, uh, we don't have the standards yet. We don't have um, a lot that it takes to really establish it as, as a framework, as we have seen, let's say, with the, the sustainability of climate change. At the same time, we have the opportunity to introduce methodologies that we have seen around startups and in the innovation space. So this is what we're trying to embrace when we're reaching out um, to partners um, that, um, that we can align around the same thought process and the same kind of thinking. Well, amazingly enough, we ended at one hour, 30 minutes on the nose. Uh, that never happens, so uh, I will take this as a win. And uh, But first, I want to thank everyone who asked questions. Uh, we will see if the panel is willing to follow up on the ones that we did not get to. Uh, I would like to thank Alice, Craig, and Ingo for their time and efforts as we develop this uh panel over the last few weeks. It has been a pleasure to have this fascinating conversation with you. And I really, on the behalf of everyone at Munich Re, really thank you for your time on these very important and uh, critical topics in the years to come. Uh, with that, uh, on behalf of Munich Re and the Rethink Sustaining Climate Risk webcast, I would like to thank you for your attendance. Uh, hopefully, you will join us for future webcasts uh, over the summer. Uh, and take care and please remain well during the epidemic. Thank you very much.